thank you for tuning in today. I am Teresa Rohr Kirchgraver. I'm a professor of medicine at the AU UGA Medical Partnership. I practice internal and adolescent medicine. And our discussion today is about the impact of sex and gender in health and disease. Now, I chose this topic for a lot of different reasons, but partly because I want to be able to help us understand more about how sex and gender affects us. And it isn't just in medicine, but it's in everything that we do. So let's think about this. When you only study one sex medicine, you're missing half of the picture. But what is exactly sex and gender to begin with? Well, first, Sex is the biological construct. It's that biological difference between men and women. It's the chromosomal de design. Perfect, fine, sex. You're born with an XX or an XY. But gender is that socially constructed rule. It, it's sort of the, you know, how we view ourselves in society, how others view us in society. The entity of sex and gender-based medicine is that field of medicine that we use to incorporate everything about the biological as well as the, the gender-based when it comes to the differentiation between different types of diseases. Bottom line is, it's not just about reproductive organs or gender, um, LGBTQ health, it's, it's about Every cell has a sex. But it isn't just about the hormones, you know? It's just, it's not that women do something differently because they have estrogen and men do something else because they have testosterone. There's a lot more to it than that. So looking at the differences between the sexes, to better get a, an understanding of how we work in a society, how we have developed, but also, how does that affect us in terms of our own health? And how does that affect us in terms of the disease process? We know that for over the last 25 years, we've been doing research within the NIH, and there's an office specifically called the Office of Women's Health. Yahoo, that's great. But there are so many gaps that still exist. And how did this kind of come about? Well, to be quite honest, 30 years ago, the health of women was in serious trouble. Why? Because most of the work that had been done looking at the causes of diseases wasn't done in us. And we women are not just little men. There is so much differences. So what happened was back in the mid-1990s, a group of women started by Florence Hazeltine came together and said, we got to do something about this. And they created the Society for Women's Health Research to encourage researchers and national organizations and grant funding agencies to put the emphasis on the differences between the sexes when it came to health and disease. So yes, there's been some significant increases over the last few years, but even still, there is a significant underrepresentation of women and underrepresented minorities in clinical trials. So up until 2018, up until 2018, 80% of the people that were participating in clinical trials were men. So well, why is that important? Well, for so many different reasons. Let's think about this for a second. So one, the Society for Women's Health Research is has been incredible, and they've been very proactive about trying to change policies to encourage more women to participate, but also to make it that the granting agencies had it a definitive process to, to make it that those research protocols included women. Back in the mid-1990s as well, AMWA, which is the American Medical Women's Association, determined that there was such a paucity of education around women's health that didn't include the bikini area. You know, for the longest time, we kind of felt like if we're talking about women's health, we're just talking about the boobs and the reproductive organs. Well, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. So AMWA helped to work to create a women's health curriculum to go into every single medical school in the country. That was useful. That was helpful. But there's still so much more to do. 
even as late as in the, in the last year or so, there's a, uh, Alma has a women's health working group that is along with the Sex and Gender Women's Health Collaborative. And I'm gonna give you some resources that you can kind of find those things out on your own. One of the organizations that has been fabulous in creating a sex and gender specific health curriculum has been Texas Tech. They've done this with a number of different agencies helping to support it. I would encourage you to consider going online. There are, there are modules that you can go through. There are different disease categories that you can breeze through. It is fabulous, specifically looking at what are the differences in health and what are the differences in disease by sex. So let's talk about this for a second. Why does this matter? Well, let me present to you a, a chest pain probably one of the more typical kinds of things that kind of come up. So a woman with, quote, atypical chest pain. Well, you've probably heard when somebody's having a heart attack is they have this crushing pain in their chest that radiates up into their jaw, it can be associated with shortness of breath, can be associated with nausea, vomiting, can give them left shoulder pain, right? Obviously, that's the typical. But women don't necessarily present that way. So this patient, Mary, she's 79 years old. For the last 11 months, she's been tired. She's not been sleeping well. She's short of breath. She's having difficulty kind of getting around. She goes to see a couple of doctors. They're like, well, you know, you got some anxiety. Well, you got some trigeminal neuralgia. Well, you know, there's something else kind of going on. Finally, she's struggling with us. She gets, she gets admitted. Turns out she gets admitted. She has a cardiac arrest while she's at the hospital. So now they know for sure, oh, this has been heart. All right, so she gets a cardiac cath, she gets her medication, everything else. Great, she knows it's a heart attack. She goes home. She goes to her doctor. She goes, huh, I'm still having these funny symptoms. They're like, ah, don't worry about it. Ah, don't worry about it. Finally, she sees, she sees her OBGYN. He says, something's not right with this. Sends her to a cardiologist who's more in tune with heart disease in women and recognizes that, oh, actually, some of those same symptoms that she was having before were not adequately treated with the cardiac cath that she had. So, so why is that? Okay, so let's look at this. I think this is a fabulous picture because most of the time, cardiac disease in women is along the coronary artery. It's, in men, it's in the middle of it. It's like, in men, there's a stop. Boom, there's a clog, it's right there, you can see it. And that's why if you look at this, um, this slide, the cardiac cath, the dye on the far, on the far uh, example, is showing you the dye's going through just fine. Doesn't look like there's any trouble at all. So she comes in with chest pain, she gets this cardiac cath, they're like, ah, you're fine, no heart attack. The guy comes in, he gets a cath, and it shows, boom, there's a big blockage. You're like, oh, there's the problem. But in actuality, what's really happening is if you notice in the next two, um, next two pictures there, if you do that cardiac cath and you do it with an ultrasound, you're actually showing that there is damage, there is blockage in the lumen in that opening of that coronary artery. There is blockage all along that coronary artery, not just in one specific spot. And so that's why when women present, and we, and we think, mm, maybe it's a heart attack. We get a cardiac cath and like, nah, don't look like it. Go on home, honey. And you're at home, you have those same symptoms again. You think, ah, eh, you know, they told me before it wasn't my heart. You stay home and then you die. Okay, so this, there are differences in the way, not only with the presentation of the symptoms that a woman presents with, but the actual physiology of what's going on. So yes, sex and gender matter. And I think cardiovascular disease is probably the one prime example of where there are significant change differences that can cause some major changes in, in health outcomes. So historically, most of this, this, this research has been done on men. So yes, we need to change that. And let me give you an example. So you know, most of the studies were done on men. Back in 1988, the Physician's Health Study said, good idea to always take an aspirin to help prevent heart attacks. Well, actually that's true in men, not true in women. It doesn't help protect us. In fact, it can actually be more harmful. So we needed to know that data. In 2005, when the Women's Health Study came out and said, no, we shouldn't be using them. So let's think about something completely different. What about, what are the sex differences in pharmacology? 
Well, if we know that most of the clinical trials for new, new drugs were done in men, what happens when they come out into practice? I think this was so well um, delineated by, by a couple of different studies. One, this looked specifically at the sex differences in how the body metabolizes drugs. And it turns out that most women have a longer time to actually metabolize that drug, and so we have more serious side effects than the guys. But when you look at how much dosages should be given, it's not changed by sex. And let me show you where it really would have made a huge difference. Do you remember Ambien? How many of you tried it? Okay. Um, when Ambien first came out, it's a, it's a drug to help you sleep, right? So, so many people with insomnia, everybody's you know, wanting Ambien. Well, what was happening is the standard dose was 10 milligrams. And so somebody would come in the office, you'd give them a 10 milligram dose. Well, it turns out for women, what was happening was we don't metabolize that drug as fast. And so we, they started to notice that there were increased traffic accidents in women. That, you know, and when they actually looked at it, we had a, a longer time for elimination, we had higher drug levels. So yeah, that drug got pulled from, not pulled from the market, I shouldn't say that, finally after so many accidents and problems, they, they recommended that the dose for Ambien in women be only five milligrams, not 10. So let's look at, at something a little bit different, psychology. We know that depression is not just in your head. We know that depression is related to symptoms of serotonin. Serotonin, low levels of serotonin though, can present in different ways by sex. So for women, it's more likely for us to show depression by sadness, by withdrawal, low self-esteem, whereas in men, it's more likely to, their depression is more likely to be explained or, or um, presented with anger, aggression, impulsivity, substance abuse, those kinds of things. So, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if we were able to consider depression in both men and women, but unfortunately, our screening tests are actually rigged towards women. Currently, every time you go to the doctor's office, you get a PHQ-2, which is a, a two-question screening questionnaire about do you have depression. And we don't differentiate if you're a guy or a girl. So what happens is that you look at these screening questions and you comment on them. So think about, you know, for, for a woman, the questions are little or no interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. If a woman's low serotonin levels, which is associated with depression, present with sadness, withdrawal, feeling hopeless, she might screen very well positive on this. But if the man's depression manifests by anger, irritability, substance abuse, that's not going to be reflected at all. So the fact that we have a screening questionnaire that's really only screening half of the population is going to miss a lot of folks who have a condition that needs to be treated. So another kind of women thing and why it's important to kind of look at both genders. You probably have heard about the female athlete triad, right? The female athlete triad is defined as, well, you're really athletic, you're really working hard, you're trying to be super healthy, but because of that, you, you can decrease the amount of energy that you're taking in with lowering the amount of food that you're taking in. So sometimes it's associated with a disordered eating, trying to eat super healthy so you only get in certain types of foods. That is decreasing the lower the energy level that's available to you. By doing so, you increase the muscle content, you, you cause menstrual dysfunction, so it became amenorrheic or not having periods. And along with that, you can get low bone mineral density. It's a condition in which I'd say, you know, the majority of, of physicians and other uh, practitioners will recognize in women, probably because you present and you stop having periods and that's a, a red flag. But it's, in, it's incredibly important because of the, the impacts not only on not having periods, but also on bone health. But we don't necessarily always think about it in guys. We, you know, we don't recognize the fact that, you know, 
in men, they can also have the male athlete triad for pretty much some of the same reasons. They decrease the amount of energy that's going in. Sometimes being lighter makes you faster, that kind of thing. But what is associated with that is a low levels of testosterone, and that then increases your, your um, resorption of, of, of bone, and you don't get the strong bones. Now, I have had a couple of guys who we recognize this on, not on purpose. They got tested for testosterone levels for some strange reason, and their testosterone levels were low. They get all freaked out and wanted to go and get extra testosterone pills when really it was they're you know, working out not too much, but working out more than they should be and not putting in enough energy stores. And we had to work more on increasing their energy stores and getting their nutrition back rather than doing some kind of bogus um, testosterone treatments. Another condition, obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring at nighttime, not getting enough oxygen in you. At first, we thought that obstructive sleep apnea was in approximately 60% of, 60 to one men to women. All right. We thought it was really a disease more of the guys. Well, actually what we turned out was it's not a guy disease. It's just that women present a little bit differently. So if you really look at what are the symptoms for women, it turns out that we actually have a lot more um, sleep apnea problems than we originally anticipated. So the sleep apnea symptoms in men have to do more with snoring, tired during the day, obesity, big neck, you stop breathing at night, you can do this kind of thing. Or maybe they have morning headaches. But in women, what women present with is a lot more subtle. It's, a, it's, it's that fatigue, it's that tiredness, not sleeping well. You're you know, peeing at nighttime. Different kinds of presentation. But when we were looking at the traditional symptoms, we were missing it in women because we didn't understand or recognize that these kind of symptoms were also a symptom of obstructive sleep apnea. So when we really took that into consideration, the ratio instead of being 60 to one is more like, you know, three to one or two to one. And I think part of the reason why we recognize it more is because having more women in, in higher academic places, having more women physicians means that you know, we're a little bit more in tune and maybe we're thinking about it a little bit more, bringing a different aspect to it. One of the other things we found out about sleep apnea is that we, women don't require as much pressure as, as um, in the CPAPs as men do. So a lot of differences. So another area, thinking going away from perhaps health and thinking more about your daily life, iGiants is the impact of gender and sex on innovation and novel technologies. And it's thinking about how does sex and gender impact all the little things that we do. So let me give you an example. Women are 47% more likely to suffer severe injuries than men. Well, let's think about this. We're not just little men. There's differences in neck structure, in the musculature of the neck, in the way that the seating position is held. But originally, the crash test dummies were made to represent the 50th percentile of men. So we need to be able to kind of take a step back and say, you know, how, we can't just design things for one size. One size doesn't fit all, especially in this case. There was an awesome study that was done. Now, this one was done in Europe, but it was so interesting because it really recognized that there's a, a significant difference in the measurements that are being done if all your crash dummies are kind of the same size. And then that changes the way that you build a car. And then that changes the way that you have, you have the seat strap. And that changes the way that you have accidents. So there's no question that, this, that the way that the studies have been done in the past are very much for the male population and not for the women. So that the protection for women in a crash was unequal to the protection of men in a crash. Now, it would be fabulous if we had some crash test dummies that, you know, had all different shapes and sizes, and, and we do, but currently, 50% of the time, the male dummy is the most commonly used. And, and even though we do have female crash dummies, they've been there since 1986, they're only used in about 5% of the testing. All right, different category, retail. Now, any of the women out there, how many times when you go to buy a suit, 
do you get a pocket? The guys? I mean, you got one here, one here, one here, and then you got the inside one, then you got the two in the pants, right? Okay. Well, why does that make a difference? Well, you know, you might think, oh, I don't want those pockets. They just make me look fat. But if you, if, let, let's say, for example, you're a type 1 diabetic and you have a pump. Where do you put your pump? How does that limit your abilities? What about, you know, you can't always have a purse. So there's just different things that, that are inherent in men's clothing versus women's clothing. Another slide example, cuffs on the bottom of your pants. They were fine for men, not so good for women. Let's think about this. You have a cuff on the bottom of your pants, you're wearing your nice little stiletto heels, and as you're walking, your foot gets caught in your cuff, boom, right onto the ground. It's an inherent problem in the manufacturing or the design of a, of a clothing product that can lead to injury. Okay, full disclosure, happened to me. I got an intracerebral bleed because I hit my head on the door frame. Okay, no on, no cuffs on my pants. So I have to tell you about Stephanie Kowalik. Stephanie Kowalik was a Polish immigrant who in the 1960s, she was working in polymer chemistry and developed Kevlar. Kevlar, the stuff for bulletproof vests, right? Saved millions of lives. Stephanie Kowalik develops Kevlar, is able to create a bulletproof vest. But it wasn't until 2012 that the bulletproof vest design was made to incorporate the curves of a woman's body. So what was happening was all the police officers were getting bulletproof vests. That's great. But when it's not designed for a woman, it was actually making things worse. One, because of the breast, the gap, there was a gap in the bulletproof vest that allowed it more easily for bullets to get in for the women than for the men. And also, if that bulletproof vest is kind of pouching out, you go to reach back to get your gun, and your hand kind of gets stuck in the bulletproof vest, and you have a harder time getting to your gun. So it was actually worse for women than for men. Luckily, because of military um, and a lot more women getting into combat, the development of, of uh, bulletproof vests have changed, and they now kind of take into account the curbs. All right. Another category, information and technology. So, I don't know, have you ever noticed that sometimes you're trying to poke on those things and you've got to go kind of hard to get it to work? Well, it's probably because when the keyboards are made for a larger male hand, and with the smaller hands and having to push more, um, with more pressure, we have a higher incidence of, of uh, injuries, especially carpal tunnel, and also injuries to the fingers. So, you know, perhaps we can kind of change the way that the design is made so that it takes that into account. So, I hope that you're kind of getting the message here that sex and gender matter. That sex should be taken into consideration when you're designing clothing or when you're designing cars or when you're analyzing any kind of study that's being done. I mean, how many times have you read a research paper and said, oh, were those mice, were those girl mice or boy mice? And does it make a difference? You know, I hope that you, you understood that there is a difference between the way men and women present, especially with diseases, and that a disease like cardiovascular disease, typical, should be out of the language because what's typical in a male is not necessarily typical in a woman. But for some reason, when the woman presents with her own typical symptoms, it's considered atypical. So I think there, there's definitely enough evidence going forward that there is a significant difference between men and women in every aspect of health and disease. And hopefully, maybe what we have to do is kind of promote this as an individual look. Because if we, if we think about what helps to protect women with certain diseases, then maybe we can delineate, you know, pull that down and figure out, well, then we could use maybe that same substance to help prevent um, in men. Can we create this change in culture? Well, I, I'm hoping. I think that there's a lot of groups looking into this. There is also some additional money that's going specifically to look for um, promoting grants and studies that have to identify the differences in sex and gender. 
If you want more, more info, hey, contact me. I'm happy to chat with you. But also, these are some awesome, awesome um, resources that we can utilize. And if you have some time, oh my gosh, these books are fabulous. Invisible Women looks at data that's been collected over years and years and how it's impacted us in our regular um, daily lives. Diagnosis Female is a, a, a myriad of stories about women being misdiagnosed just because of the fact that they were women presenting with diseases. And the same thing with um, Maya Doonesbury's book on doing harm. Excellent discussion, excellent reads, opens up our minds to, to so many different ways of looking at things. And I love the Scientific America um, articles that was, it's not just a women's issue, because what affects women also affects men, but perhaps in a slightly different way. So thank you so much for listening in tonight. I'd, I'd be happy to open this up for discussion. It doesn't have to be questions. Um, we like to be able to talk about stuff. We like to be able to bring things up. And how has this affected you in your daily life? So one thing that kind of came across is why is healthcare more biased towards males even today? And what can we do to change this gender disparity in the quality of care? Okay, well, I think you probably answered that by, by most of this talk. Healthcare is biased towards males because for the last couple hundred years, who were the physicians? Who were the scientists, right? Who were, who were involved in the clinical trials? Okay, I just have to tell you this. So do you all remember when Viagra came out? The Viagra, the drug for erectile dysfunction? When Viagra came out, at the same time, birth control pills are out already, right? Do you know that it costs you $5 copay for your Viagra, but birth control pills were not covered? because they were not treating a disease. Birth control pills cost us 50 bucks a month. The guys were getting their Viagra for five buck copay. Oh, who are the majority of people in Congress and Senate making all these legislative decisions? Who were the leaders of the healthcare industry that was making all these decisions? Okay, so what can we do to change this disparity? One, we need more more diversity at all levels. That includes the women. We need more diversity at all levels. But we also need those folks that are in positions of power to be thinking about this and to help be the sponsors to make some of this change happen. Can research be conducted in a way that considers sex differences? Absolutely, positively. That's what, the sex and gender, that's what the Sex and Gender Women's Health Collaborative has put forth. That's what the Society for Women's Health Research has been, has been advocating for. Yes, and how can we do that? Well, one, when the NIH now gives grants for, for studies, they specifically ask for the percentage of women that are, that are expected to be involved in the study. So they're putting it right up front, and they're saying, make sure that you have a certain number of women involved in your study make sure that you have a certain number of, of women that are involved in not only the clinical trials, doing the research part of it, but from the, from the participation. But that's also where you come in. When was the last time you participated in the clinical trial? You know, when the COVID vaccine was coming out and they were asking for volunteers, I stood up because, you know, I said, I can't be talking about participating in clinical trials and how we need more women if I'm not willing to do it myself. So I participated in the AstraZeneca trial, and it helped me get my vaccine a little bit earlier, but you know, hey, what the heck. But we needed to have more, so we can't just talk about it, we have to do it ourselves. Um, so absolutely. The other thing is I think that we have to be questioning all the time. I mean, one of the reasons I got really involved with this was I went to a, um, I went to a presentation on cardiovascular disease, and the person presenting was talking about how you need um, anticoagulants for a little bit longer when, when you have a person that has a stent if they have a small coronary artery. So afterwards I went up and I said, well, any differences in men and women? He's like, huh, you didn't look at that. I said, well, but wait a minute, women traditionally have smaller coronary arteries, so the assumption would be that in women we should pay more attention and be thinking about longer anticoagulant states. Ah, huh, didn't look at that. Well, so maybe that's what we need to be doing is asking for 
that those numbers asking for that participation. And when you're reading a, a trial on mice or whatever, were they girl mice or boy mice? Write them and ask them. Um, thank you. Somebody commented on these are examples I never would have thought of. As a man who probably takes these gender disparities for granted, how can I do my part in being part of the solution instead of the problem? So I have to give you a fabulous example, all right? So just recently, a colleague was, was told about, you know, there's this new job, we have this, we have this guy, he's gonna be perfect for it, let's just go hire him. They're, they're, they're telling my colleague who's the boss, and they're saying, he looks great. And my colleague takes a step backwards and goes, well, now wait a minute, this guy looks great on paper, who else did you interview for this position? Well, no, he's perfect. How many women did you interview? Oh, there aren't any. Really? There are no women that would be eligible to take this, you know, to take this position? Well, I'm not hiring him until you've shown me that you've done the search and that you've included a certain percentage of women in your search as well as a certain percentage of underrepresented minorities. That's how you make some things change happen. You as somebody in a position of power, you as somebody who recognizes the differences, you as somebody who notices that she just said that. Oh yeah, maybe the next time you're in class, maybe the next time you're in a meeting and you recognize, oh, you know, Jane just said this, kind of got poo-pooed and then John said it. Oh yeah, John, great idea. No, what you can do is, is amplify the voice so that when Jane says, something, you go, Jane, that's a great thought. Huh, I really appreciate that comment. And then when John says it again, you go, oh, John, that was great. Jane, Jane, just, Jane just said that. Good for you. You picked up on it. Let's amplify those voices in everything that we do. So next thought is how do we actively support women in ensuring the laws around women's health are not negatively impacting women on a wide scale? So I guess I need to figure out a little bit more about what that means. The laws around women's health are not negatively impacting women on a wide scale. So currently, the majority of the laws about women's health are not made by women, right? For some reason, there's a lot of need to control a woman's body by people who are not women. So, one, you can ensure that the people that are making those laws understand what is needed. You can make sure that the people that are making those laws have a good representation and represent your views. So, let me give you an example. Um, before, before the Affordable Care Act came in, because birth control was not a covered entity for most insurance companies, it only covered it if there was a problem. So most of my patients had dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Almost all of my women patients had dysfunctional uterine bleeding because if I put that diagnosis code with their prescription for birth control, it got covered because it was a problem. After the Affordable Care Act came in, preventative services were a free covered entity. So then I had to switch them all to just, they just needed it for birth control. So there are workarounds, but we have to ensure that the laws that are out there give equal opportunity and equal coverage for conditions and not just you know, one side versus the other. I appreciate this. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for the thoughtful comments. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. I hope that this discussion is gonna keep on going in just many different realms and in many different ways. Thank you for, for listening in this evening.